Hello and welcome to, uh, to the Auto Rob course, uh, which is offered at the University of Michigan uh, as, course, as undergraduate course ECS 367 and graduate course uh, Robotics 511. Um, I am Professor Chad Jenkins, just down here in the corner. Hello. And, uh, and so we're going to continue uh, our lectures for this course, now going into forward kinematics. Um, and so right to this point, what we've covered is, you know, if we want to build the mobile manipulator, we've built up how we can, uh, how we can, how we can have a, um, a mobile base and be able to do autonomous path planning for it. We've started to go through how we can simulate and control uh, the joints of our robots or the system and physically simulate systems. And so now we want to think about how we can actually make articulated uh, articulated structures move, such as uh, such as uh, as this uh, the serial chain robot right here. And so we're going to do that through uh, through forward kinematics. Um, and so uh, so what we what we're moving to in, is, is, a, is a major section of the course where we're given the structure of a robot arm. What we want to be able to do is compute uh, a number of things. First, we want to be able to compute the forward kinematics, which is given that we can infer the the um, we want to be able to infer the pose of the end effector, given that we know that the state the state of each joint as well as the given kinematic structure. And then what we're going to cover later is inverse kinematics, which is given that we know where we want the end effector to be, uh, the the gripper. Uh, how can we compute the joint states? Where does the every joint need to be posed in order to make this happen? Um, and so, you know, the first thing I would suggest is start off with uh, with a linear algebra refresher. So we we have that. I have my slides from last year. I'm hoping maybe I'll be able to put an update from uh, for this year, but there's not going to change very much. Uh, and uh, and also. Um, so just to, to note that those slides are are up there. These are from the new slides that I have created. Hopefully, I'll get those I'll get those done. Um, but it's just a few few little tweaks here or there. The slides from last year should still work. Um, I find a lot of students love uh, love watching videos online in terms of um, in terms of getting some insight for linear algebra because I think it is probably the most important math class that we have as a that we use in AI and robotics. Um, and you know, and when you see it visualized, I think that's that you know, linear algebra just meant immense, uh, is just very amenable to uh, to um, to uh, to seeing it in action, right, and as vector spaces. And so these uh, these can be really helpful. Um, so coming back, uh, we're gonna so you can you can go ahead and start with that linear algebra lecture, um, and then uh, and then we're gonna come to how we can do uh, forward kinematics and inverse kinematics. And just to to give an example, especially for the undergraduate students. Um, Here's the Rex arm that we have right here. So this is a this is a robot arm, four link robot arm. We consider this to be a serial chain robot because it's uh, it's open ended. Um, so it's an open chain robot. Uh, there's no cycles in it. It just goes from one link to the next. And there's only one child for every link. And so we can move this around, see it in action. And you should be able to make this robot work, uh, at least uh, choreograph it to do interesting things after this lecture. And so that's what we're going to start off with, with forward kinematics. And then we're going to move to inverse kinematics after that. Um, where this sits in our larger spectrum of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of considering of being able to build our own robot operating system. Let me put this down real quick. Um, is that uh, is that the forward kinematics and inverse kinematics are essential parts of of what we what we do um, what we what we need to do to control our robot and so we're going to cover that in this lecture as well as next lecture and then later on uh, and then after we talk a little bit about um, about how we can do uh, robot choreography with uh, using finite state machines and other decision making architectures and a little bit about robot uh, a, a robot middleware um, just sort of to, to link all these together then we'll go with the inverse kinematics and in, and uh, in, uh, in lectures 11 and 12. and so let's really just focus on the forward kinematics right now um, and let's consider an interesting task that we have from my, my research group uh, which is uh, and so so um, so Jeming, who's one of the, the GSIs for this class, one of the TAs for this class. Uh, basically, his, some of his recent work was looking at how we can, uh, how can we have a robot be able to build a champagne tower? And, uh, and through the magic of forward kinematics and inverse kinematics, we can do that, um, as well as some research into how we perceive transparent objects. Um, and so what we have just on the, on the, uh, on the table here are, are a collection of, uh, of just uh, champagne glasses. 
And being able to, to pick up each of these is, is actually quite difficult because the robot can't necessarily see these glasses. Um, and a lot of modern sen robot sensors are actually, um, it's actually difficult to perceive transparent objects. Uh, but some of the work that we've been doing is being able to, to use, uh, to use uh, different types of cameras, uh, such, as, uh, such as light field cameras, planoptic cameras, in order, to, uh, in order to perceive these types of transparent objects, which usually defeat, uh, which be difficult for color cameras or even your Kinect style uh, uh, RGBD cameras, red, uh, color, color plus depth cameras. Um, but we can perceive these objects, but then we still need to be able to grasp these objects, be able to, uh, to, um, to get the gripper to that location and execute, uh, and execute a grasp and then be able to put the, the object down. Um, inverse kinematics lets us say, if we can see where this object is, we can essentially say, here's, here's where I'd like the gripper to be. And then the gripper can, uh, can grasp that object. Can we can, and we can move to that position and forward kinematics lets us, lets us express given that we want the object to be there. I want the gripper to be there. Um, you know, once we solve for the joint states, how can we then reason about, uh, about a set of motions where the robot, where we can, uh, where we can draw the robot out and test for things like collision. Um, and so we can do that and be able to have our robot uh, pour drinks for us. Uh, trust me, that's not alcoholic. So, uh, so, so it's just your, your favorite um, apple, you know, apple cider from the market. Just wanted to say that. Um, and so forward kinematics and inverse kinematics is really important for, uh, for to, getting our, to getting our robots work. Um, and if we have the, these types of this, this type of capability, uh, we can model and control any open chain robot. You can, we can work with other types of robot too, but this course we're going to focus on what we call open chain robots. Um, as we showed in some, in some of the other, uh, other classes, uh, you can have, uh, you can have robots such as the scar arm. Let me turn the volume down just a little bit. There we go. Um, and so the scar arm is just a, it like the Rex arm is a, is a very, uh, that, that I showed earlier, is just a, a very simple um, three degree of freedom arm. So it rotates about, uh, rotates planar to the, to the ground surface and then has another arm to, to, to rotate even further than that. And then a prismatic, um, prismatic gripper that brings the, brings the end effector down. And you, you oftentimes see these types of robots in like laboratory environments where you need to do uh, testing and chemicals and, and test tubes and things like that. Um, and just other applications. Um, in, uh, in more uh, manufacturing type environments, let me turn this down even a little bit more. Um, and uh, in manufacturing type environments, you oftentimes see robots like, uh, like the Moto Man uh, that, that they have here. And so it's basically uh, picking up a, 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 an item and then sanding it off. And so it's really important to be able to know like exactly where the, where that uh, where the tool tip, the the end effector or the, the object that's being grasped by the robot is being is, uh, is is where exactly that is going to be. So you can get it. So you can sand it just enough, not too much, and making sure that it that it is getting uh, it is getting smoothed out. Um, and so you have robots of, of these types of forms. And note that that in these in these environments, it's it's closed off to so the robots just acting in isolation. And and uh, and we can and we can get the robot to move very precisely in doing these things using the types of PID controllers and other types of core or other types of uh, uh, control low level control algorithms with a choreographed finite state machine, which we'll talk about uh, later in this course. Um, and additionally, you can also do things. You can also make structures like the the biped hopper. So this is a, this is just a hopper that was created by the MIT Leg Lab uh, a couple decades ago, uh, and so. Um, so the hopper, I think, is 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 really cool. Um, this is a video from I think the late '80s, or early '90s, um, and so you can you can model and control structures like this. Um, and I love the biped hopper. It makes me think about and so so back in the '90s there were uh, there was a transition from from robotics. So uh, so Jessica Hodgins made this interesting transition from uh, from robotics with uh, with her advisor Mark Raybert into uh, into making using these same ideas for for animation. Um, which makes me rethink assignment two a little bit, and that if uh, if you wanted to create a biped hopper um, and be able to control it, uh, I would offer four advanced extension points for that because I think that's really cool. It's been on my list to do just on my own for a while, um, but I think uh, I think I'm happy to talk talk to anybody who wants to wants to try that advanced extension. Um, but one thing I think that's really cool about this is uh, these biped hoppers were the were the predecessors uh, to uh, to other work by Boston Dynamics. I am definitely turning that down. 
uh, <laughs> uh, uh, such as the big dog robot. Um, and so big dog is, uh, you know, is, uh, is a very stable, uh, very, uh, very capable, um, machine. It uses, uh, um, hydraulic actuators. That, that, that's why you're hearing that, that noise. Um, I believe to keep the, I, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm not a developer big dog, but I believe that is to keep the, the temperature of the liquid up. So they, so it stays, uh, so they can actually make sure that the actuators still work properly. Um, I, those, those things are loud. If you've ever been around big dog or Atlas, I've been around Atlas myself, so I'm only going to speak, speak to that. It is loud. Um, I think they've gotten the noise down a little bit, but, but, you know, but these, these robots are, are really, really interesting to, to, to see. And their, their, their stability is, is just really incredible. And so, uh, and so we can, we can model these types of, these types of, of systems. Uh, oh, I, I missed that video. It's cool because it slipped and then it got back up. Um, you can also uh, model control uh, quad rotors. So, so this was, uh, this was early work that, that we did uh, to just get a, a driver for the Parrot AR drone running. This was years ago. Um, you know, uh, and so that was our first, uh, first or second run with, uh, with just getting the driver running. We got to remember, we got to be careful with, uh, with, uh, with robots. Safety is most important. Um, I'm glad that Evan survived that. Um, and you know, and, and these types of systems can be done, be used to do more advanced control. So, uh, so at ETH Zurich, they had a they have a flight arena. Um, this is this video from uh, from a couple of years ago, and they've just done amazing work in being able to do uh, acrobatic tricks like this. And so, I would highly recommend uh, checking out that video and some of the TED talks that they have. They're really they're really excellent. Um, so when we come back to, to what we're trying to do, so, so those are the different types that, you know, those are just a small sampling of the array of, of types of robots that we need to, that we'd like to model and control. Um, but what we're trying to get to the core question is how do we express the kinematics, uh, uh, you know, how we express the kinematic parameters of a, of a system of an articulated system and be able to use that to draw it out in, in workspace. So this is just showing a PR2 and all the different coordinate frames that we might, uh, that we would attach to a, a robot like this to be able to, to express what it looks like in workspace. Um, and so this is what we'll do with, uh, with, with projects three and four in the course. Um, I will give you, there will be arbitrary robot descriptions that you will be given. Um, and then you will, your code should be able to display all of those, uh, at just any arbitrary d definition, robot definition, which includes the geometries and be able to, to show that working in the browser. Um, one thing that's really important is that your code should be, um, must work for, for any robot, any robot description. Um, so what happens is the robot description changes, but your code does not change, right? And so that's, and so we're built, we have an engine, essentially a Ford kinematics engine, a kinematics and dynamics engine, uh, maybe the kinematic, maybe just the kinematics engine. And so I'm going to show a quick demo, uh, just to, just to show you what that looks like. So if I head over to the, to the browser and you start up the Knievel stencil, um, what you're going to see, you know, for, for a particular, uh, for a particular, um, robot description. So in this case is the MR2. Uh, robot, um, which is just a, just a blocky sort of test robot, you know, default robot that we have. Um, it just starts off in the, and the pieces are bouncing and they're we're really just asking you, put me together, put me together in terms of a robot. So this is what you'll see at the start. And then, um, and then when we, uh, when I, when I get the, when I, when I start my Ford kinematics by clicking the, the, the we're clicking off the just starting state, um, I'm able to see the robot draw out appropriately. So this is just a description of the, of the robot and I've be able to lay out the, the Ford kinematics. Um, and so this puts this, this is essentially assembles the robot into its proper, into its proper joints. And if I click the display, I can show all of the joints. So there's just little controls on the side that we have here. Um, and so I can show, I'm going to show the joints of the robot. And so this just shows all the different joints of the robot and how it lays out. Same same uh, code that's that's running, except now I change the robot description just using the URL, and it's important that I should be able to change the URL for all of these lectures. You don't want to see all that, but I just I'm just highlighting what's uh, what we what we have right here, and so now with no change to my code, just to change the robot description, I can then uh, I can then run the run the forward kinematics, and I can draw out our fetch robot. Note the fetch is only for the for the graduate students. Um, but this should work with, with any robot description that we, that we have. 
Um, I could do the same thing for another robot. robot. So, so we have the Baxter description. So if I then start the Baxter description, that should be able to run. Notice I haven't really worked out all the bugs on this, uh, this description file. That's why we get this, uh, there's extra lights in the geometry, I don't know. I just need to get time to fix that. Right now, um, same thing, but this is the Sawyer robot from the former Rethink Robotics. And so, uh, so we can see what that robot looks like. There we go. And an example that we'll, we'll talk about later on is the URDF example. So this is just a description that was made based off of a tutorial using by, used by, uh, by Ross.org. And so we can just draw that robot description out too. So it's really just important to say that, that the, the robot description changes, but the code doesn't change. Our Ford kinematics should work for all of these, all of it, all these robot descriptions, the one we can think of and the ones that are still to, still to be imagined. All right. So coming back, you know, we're going to, we're going to write this general sort of this general kinematics engine to be able to lay out all of these different, different types of robots, given the given these descriptions and the graduate students will create a, their own robot description as well. And so what we're going to do is uh, we're going to talk about Ford kinematics in this lecture and the next lecture, then we'll come back to inverse kinematics. Um, so let's, let's, let's go deeper with Ford kinematics and say that the problem again is to infer the pose of the end effector given the, that we, what we know about the state of, of the joints. Um, and we're going to, we're going to find that pose as, as, and it's going to be the, it's not just the pose of the end effector we want to find. We need to actually find the pose of every frame along the robot. Every joint and every link is going to, is going to be inside of a common three dimensional workspace. And we're going to assume for this inference that we're going to be given the robot's kinematic definition, the geometry that is, that is, uh, that, that, that shows up the 3d geometry of every, of every link and the current state of all joints. And so we're gonna know how every joint is, is posed. We're gonna know those values. And so this lecture, we're gonna assume that the, that, the, um, that the joints are not moving. There are no motors associated to the joints. The next lecture, we're gonna add what we need in order to consider the, rot the, the rotation or translation of every motor uh, and, and factor that into the forward kinematics uh, formulation. And so forward kinematics can be, is, uh, is formally described as a many to one mapping uh, from configurations to the reachable workspace of end effector poses. Um, and so configuration is a way for us to talk about, end, uh, talk about the joint states of the robot and workspace talks about the, the space, uh, 3D space all around the robot. Um, and so, uh, so with forward kinematics, uh, what we have is uh, we have a number of frames that we want to consider. So there's the global flame, frame W, um, which is uh, which is our world frame. Um, if you assume that the base can move uh, and is not just fixed on the global frame, then we have our robot base, which we're going to consider to be frame zero. And so that's the that is the that's the frame that can can move around uh, globally. Um, and so that might be a base that's on wheels moving around, or it could be uh, a, a flying system if you want a robot arm on a flying system. And then we're going to consider the end effector to be where the where the actual manipulator is, where the where the where the gripper is. And so in this case, it's going to be frame six. And what we need to find in many cases is the is the end, is the transform of the end effector with respect to the base. Um, but oftentimes it will be that if, if the base is aligned with your global frame and so for static, for robots that are static, that's usually what we want to find. But then we'll also have to add a global transform onto that if our, if our base is moving. And so we'll talk about how to do that. Our workspace is the 3D spaces around the robot. It is the metric space that, that's around us is our usual sort of intuition of space. And so we're, we're going to call that workspace. And then we're going to call a kinematic chain. Uh, is something is is uh, is a particular type of robot where we have n plus one links and um, that are connected by n joints, and then we're going to put a coordinate frame on each of those links. So coming back to our, so you see the example that's there, but coming back to our our Rex arm right here, right. So you'll note that this is a this is an open chain robot. It's a kinematic chain that consists of one link right here with a joint here. And then another link here that has a, that has, that's connected to the next joint right there. Then our link up here, which is connected to our last joint. And then we have our end effector, which sits here at the end. And so this, so what we're showing here is just a, an extended example of what a, of what a Rex arm might look like. 
or what a re- yeah what a what a, a kinematic chain could look like. Um, and so uh, so we have coordinate frames on each of those links. We're going to note that there are joints that uh, that the joints that connect a uh, joint joints connect two uh, two links together. And so we consider one of those links that are connected to the joint to be the child and the other link to be the parent. Uh, the joint motion, the motion of the joint is considered to only affect the child, not to affect the parent. So it's the movement of the child with respect to the parent. We can have two types of joints. Uh, one is revolute. Um, that means it's rotational. Uh, another is prismatic if it's translational. And so in this case, we're only going to have rotational revolute joints. Um, and, when the, and so when we're looking at this, uh, we note that there are, there are a number of joints. And so uh, in this case, link zero is going to be the parent of joint one. Um, and then joint one is a, is a, is a child of, uh, of joint one. Link one is a child of joint one. And so this, this carries through through the rest of the, of the formulation. Um, given that we know the state of a particular joint, um, is that, uh, that we, can, we can express how the parent is related to the child uh, the parent uh, link is related to the to the child link as well as the child joint by a uh, by a homogeneous transform, um, and so that transform consists of a ro of a rotation uh, that is expressed by the, the block matrix R, and a translation with that with a, a an offset vector that's that's represented by O i uh, O i negative one right here, um, and so that's gonna so this is gonna this is what we call a homo homogeneous transform. And, uh, and so this, this is only a local transform between, uh, between a parent and a child. We can, if we, if we represent that, this, uh, this transform for all of our, for all of our joints and, and that, that can relate, that can, that is connecting these links together, we can, uh, we can figure out the relationship between any, uh, any link in our, in our robot, um, against, um, uh, any link, uh, we can, we can find the, the relationship uh, the the metric relationship in workspace between any link in our um, any link in our, our our robot and so T I J right here just basically says says that and so we can multiply these matrices together and so we should note that uh, that the the vector the state of all joints is called a configuration so if we looked at uh, at the at the configuration of each of these joints and put them collectively together, usually as a as a vector, um, that that is our that is our configuration. And the space of all possible configurations is called configuration space or C space. So the problem that we have with forward kinematics is that given a particular configuration Q, we want to find the transformation into that the transformation that 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 um that takes the link from its own space or the end effector from its own space into its proper positioning in the global workspace. So we can put, so we can essentially uh, align all these frames together, position them in their, in their proper configuration. And so the problem that we have is that every link considers itself to be the center of the universe. Every, every frame has its own origin and considers that origin to be the, the, the center of the world. But how do we get these origins to these frames to, uh, to, to work together so that we can actually pose all of these systems the right way? And so what we're going to do is just to think about how this could work out is we're going to consider all links to be aligned with a, with a global origin just to start off with. And we're going to move all of them along and drop them off at their pr proper positioning in the, in the workspace. So if we consider the global axis, we're gonna we're gonna then move everything, all of our all of our uh, all of our um, links to to uh, to to where the base frame is, and we're gonna and we're gonna and we're gonna do a rotation and translation of all of these together, um, and just just uh, just put them where they need to be. So here's everything at the all of our links at the at the base node, all of our frames at the base node. We're gonna go now to uh, to link one, bring everything with us except for the base, and then leave that there. Uh, and then leave uh, leave link one there. Then we're going to go to link two. We're going to put it in its, in its proper place and then leave it there. Then we're going to put link three in its proper place and take everything else with us. And we're going to keep going along and along and along until we have uh, laid out the proper structure of our robot. And note that we've built up these transforms all along the, the T's, and then we can multiply those together in order to get our transform from the world in, uh, from the link frame into the world frame. And additionally, we can take any point, any point on the end effector, 
uh, and then transform that point into into the world frame. Uh, and so we can simply take a point that is going to be uh, that represents the, a location on the on the end effector, multiply it by our our composed transformation matrix, and that gives us our point in the world frame. And even though we we particularly care about the end effector, this could be any point on any link uh, on our entire robot, and that is actually how our robot gets drawn out uh, in in workspace. And so this brings up two real important questions. Uh, one is how do we re how do we represent homogeneous transforms this four by four matrix that expresses the relationship between a parent link and a child link, and then how do we compute the transform? Uh, how do we compose that that transform from our from our end effector frame into the world frame and, and do that hierarchically? And so those are the two questions that we really want to think about. We can sort of sort of a checklist of forward kin of forward kinematics that we want to that we're going to have to that we're going to need to fulfill in order to to make this work. Um, I'm going to skip talking about the current state of all joints because we'll revisit that in the next lecture. And going from the bottom up, we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to start just by talking about how we define the kinematics of, of robotic systems. Um, and so, uh, when we think about ways to define uh, robot kinematics, uh, there's usually two major ways that we that we think about. Um, traditionally, we've used what was called denovet hartenberg convention, um, and so this is a uh, and I'll, I'll talk about that uh, at the end of lecture eight. I'll go into just a little bit of detail about it. Um, but this is this is essentially how we can uh, how we, it, the DH convention essentially says here are parameters that describe how uh, how um, they relate uh, a parent and a child link, and then uh, and then you can compose that into four uh, four matrices that you can multiply together. Um, it's uh, it has advantages and it has disadvantages, which we'll we'll talk about later. Um, but in recent years, what we've what we've known with the rise of the robot operating system, uh, ROS.org, um, you we've seen the, the the rise of the URDF convention, um, and uh, URDF um, is just sort of this is just an example of what that what that looks like. I took that from the URDF documentation. Um, URDF is uh, is described on on ROS.org, and so you can go into more details. There's more more tutorials about it. I want to think less of it from a user's perspective and more from how would we want to build if somebody gave us URDF for for any type of uh, for any type of robot. Um, you know, can we? How can we? How can we build up? How can we use that directly, or even make our own URDF system? And so what URDF stands for is the Unified Robot Description Format. And so that's what we use. That is, we use a JavaScript version of that, uh, sort of URDF composed into a JavaScript object, a jo um, or URDF-like JavaScript object, I would say. Um, and so we can we so URDF is uh, is really defined by its implementation. So I don't know if there's a consistent standard for it, but if you go to ROS.org, it will tell you what the current URDF uh, sort of convention is, um, or or you know what the description is. But what it does is that it uses it it's, uh, it provides a definition of an articulated structure, and that articulated structure is represented as a tree with uh, with uh, with a, a tree uh, graph structure. Um, where we have nodes that are represented as links and joints are transforms as, as edges. Um, and, you know, we're sort of expanding this out. We're, we're going to consider joints as, uh, as, as nodes and of themselves. And this is amenable to a recursive, to doing forward kinematics in a recursive manner. When we treat the, tra when we treat the, the, recur the traversal down, down, this, uh, down this kinematic tree as a, uh, as a stack. And so we're going to essentially build up this... Uh, Build up our our, um, our transforms in this matrix stack structure, um, but from a file perspective, URDF is represented through XML, an extensible markup language uh, um, specification, uh, with sort with uh, with nested joint tags. Um, to see to give an example of what this looks like, we can uh, we can take the URDF example that sits on on ROS.org, and so this is just a this is just a sort a small slice of it um, that I can manage to put on one slide, so we can go through. And I think it's just helpful to go through this example to see what it looks like um, if you wanted to make your own robot description and be able to parse it as well. So if we took this uh, this file here, this is a file in XML format. And we sort of drew it out. Um, you sort of see over there on the left. You know, you get uh, you get something that looks like um, 
like what this what you get something that that sort of is indicative of what what, what this could look like. Uh, note that that URDF does not necessarily specify uh, the geometries. You have external references out to to the geometries, so you have sort of blobs for links there. Um, but let's let's decompose this example a bit. So what we can do is just note that our robot starts off as one big object, right? So that we have one big sort of tag that says uh, robot name is that is one marker, uh, an opening tag, and then a close tag at the bottom, which is which specifies uh, which will contain our robot. So we have an empty robot at this case, and we'll give it a name. Um, we're going to specify robot links. So our system is going to have four links: link one, link two, link three, and link four. And so that will be comprised there. Um, and then we're going to specify the joints of this robot. So the joints is where the top where we really lay out the topology of our kinematics. And so every joint will connect two links to each other. Joint one connects link one to link two, where link one is the parent. Joint two connects link one to link three, where link one is the parent. And joint three connects link three to link four, where link three is the parent. And we should and uh, and so so now we've laid out the top topology of our of our robot. We have an origin field that specifies the transform parameters from the parent uh, to the child frame. And so we should note this is really the positioning of the of the joint with uh, with respect to its parent link. And uh, this transform consists of a translational offset, which is encompassed in the X, Y, Z field and a rotational offset, uh, which is which is uh, which is given in the RPY or roll pitch yaw field. And so this is going to specify the rotation and translation of the joint with respect to its parent link. Then we also have an axis field, which specifies the axis, the axis of, of motion, of action uh, for, uh, for, a particular, for a particular joint. Um, so this would be the, the axis that our joint would rotate by, or if it's a, a prismatic joint, the axis of translation for the joint, how it's gonna extend. And so we can think about how we can translate. We'll get to, in the next lecture, how we can translate about an axis, but also we'll talk about how we can rotate about an axis as well. And this will motivate our use of, uh, of quaternions to represent the, the, the motion of, uh, of motors about, of, about an axis. And so, uh, so, this, so how does it, so when we think about how this is described, so that's, that's the URDF format. Uh, we're taking a lot of that and we're using it to, uh, to, to describe robots in Knievel. We're using essentially the same formulation except now as in JavaScript objects, uh, now as, as JavaScript objects. Um, and so, uh, so if you wanna look how we describe that same uh, URDF example, you can go into the stencil repository. And so, uh, so there's robots right here. So if you look inside the robots directory, and then you look at robot underscore urdf.example.js. Uh, you'll see this file right here. And so this will just give you a, so we're just walking through this. Uh, so what we do is create the robot object. Uh, the robot object at the top is, consists of the robot that is being, that is uh, currently being expressed in the, in the stencil during, at runtime. Um, and then that robot has a name. So in this case, the, we had the, um, the, uh, the name of, uh, of this example is URDF example, but it equates to test robot from our, from our description in the, uh, in the, um, in, uh, in, in the, uh, it, that, that we borrowed from, uh, from the Ross tutorial. We note that the, that the origin of the robot, so the positioning of the base with respect to the global frame is given by our robot.origin uh, up here. And so that has a translation and a, an orientation, rotation from the, from the global link. Uh, we've named the root link, so we've given that the, the base, so we've specified which link is the base, and then we've also specified which links are in our, our system, links one, two, three, and four. We note that when we're indexing into a particular link the, for the robot object in JavaScript, that we can, we can access that, uh, that, uh, that, ro that link by, by, by saying robot.links, and then uh, in brackets, uh, using a string to specify the link name. Um, and then we can access any uh, any attribute of the link inside of uh, inside inside of that object by put just putting dot and the name of the of of the attribute. So in this case, uh, if we want the link the parent joint of link two, we can express it using this expression here. Going down a bit, we can also express the joints of our of our system. Uh, uh, and so the joints basically, uh, we have th the three joints that we mentioned before are still here. We can give the X, Y, Z origin, uh, the X, Y, Z attributes. We can specify the links and child children of the parent as well as the axis. 
Um, note that this is just going into a little bit more detail about the joint specifying parents and children, the XYZ and roll pitch yaw transform uh, trans, uh, offsets, uh, the joint actions for the for the motion, and we should also note that there are, there are three different types of uh, the three different types of um, of joints that we that we're considering. Uh, and so one is continuous or joints that produce motion. So there's a continuous joints which have rotation without limit, a revolute joints which has rotation within joint limits, and then a prismatic joint which does translation with, within limits. There are also fixed joints too, but for the most part you can you can ignore those, um, uh, or we'll have special mechanisms to deal with those. Uh, similar to joints, we can index into similar to links, we can index into joints by saying robot.joints and then giving a string for the name of the joint so we can access any property of the, the joint, such as the axis of joint three. And lastly, at the bottom, what you'll see are geometries that are associated with, with every body in the um, every every object in the um, in the uh, every object in the um, in the robot, um, and so every link has a has a geometry. That's what we use to, to draw it out. You shouldn't have to deal with these geometries if you do your forward kinematics the right way and you respect the the definition. The Knievel stencil will handle the pro the handling of these geometries. Um, but if you want to make a new robot, then you have to go in and either uh, use three GS to specify what the geometry looks like or import uh, that those geometries usually as a collada file or some sort of um, uh, uh, or uh, an STL geometry, a wavefront OBJ, uh, something something like that. And so, if we're looking at uh, at what uh, at, at our Ford kinematic checklist right now, uh, so we've got the the definition, the robot's kinematic definition, uh, and so we're we're working with that. We can now move on to thinking about you know how do we express the geometry of each link, and so. Uh, so similar to, to your favorite, you know, video games and, and animations, uh, we use a very simple, we use a similar uh, geometric representation where we can, uh, we can specify an object. So this is, a, this is an example of a, a sort of a house-like structure that's specified as a, as a geometry. And so we have a collection of points and each of those points uh, is, a three, is a 3D vertex. And so we can specify the locations of, of, each, of, the, of each of those points. Um, and so what you're just seeing over here to the, to the right is the, is the index of every vertex and the location of that, of that vertex in the, within the space of the, of the link frame. And, uh, and we can connect vertices together to form, uh, to form faces of the, of the, of the, of the, um, of the link surface. And so in this case, you can just looking at this sort of house-like data structure, we can form one face, the front face by connecting, uh, vertex zero to vertex one vertex two, vertex three, vertex four, and back to vertex zero. Um, similarly, we can specify one, one, uh, one, um, one part of the roof of this house by connecting verte vertex zero to vertex four to vertex nine and vertex five and back to vertex zero. And so we can, so these types of structures are commonly found in, in some of the, the file formats that we've discussed before, such as uh, wavefront OBJ, Collada, or uh, an STL geometry. Once we have those geometries, we can then move the link frame. Uh, and so in this case, we're just rotating the link frame. So if you're looking at it with respect to the homogeneous transform, we're changing the, the angle that uh, is represented by the rotation R. Um, and so as we move the link frame, that, that inherently moves the, uh, moves the geometries of the, of the object along with it. And so, uh, so what's really critical for us is, is that for every joint and every link, we want to be able to specify what its, what its transform is going to be uh, with respect to the world frame, right? And so you're going to store that. So the, the base of the robot, the global, is going to be stored in, uh, in robot.origin.x form, and that will be a, a 2D array. And similarly, we'll store, uh, we'll store for a particular link, or a joint, we're going to store. Uh, we're going to store this 4D matrix in uh, in this X form structure, which is going to represent the transform from the link frame into the world frame. So we can just move that 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 transform around. Um, as a side note, uh, what we should remember is uh, in uh, in JavaScript, uh, we're going to represent these uh, these matrices as as two dimensional arrays. Um, and so what you'll note is that is an array of arrays. Um, and so there's four arrays in this, uh, in our, in our homogeneous transform. 
and each array uh, is uh, is going to give an element of this uh, of this matrix, uh, or is going to provide a a a, a, um, a a row of this matrix. And so you know, so that's basically you know, so it's it's not that complicated to represent the geometry of its each link, but we're still but once we can do that, now we have to figure out how we were going to represent. Uh, how we're going to represent these form, these these transforms, uh, such that we can express a homogeneous transform from the link frame into the world frame, uh, and then after that we'll talk about how we can how we can build this up into uh, and, and represent this hierarchically. But we're just going to talk about the structure of an homogeneous transform first. So so we're going to go to to we're going to ask this question of how to represent homogeneous transforms. And so let's start with a with a transform for a simple example, just our our simple box geometry right here. And so it's a simple geometry with uh, with four vertices uh, that are connected together. Um, and let's just ask uh, for this uh, for this two D robot with a uh, with a box geometry. Um, how can we? And oh, I should also note that these uh, that these these points uh, are these vertices are expressed as vectors. Uh, in the links frame, so every point is going to be uh, is going to have an x y location because we're in, we're in two D, um, and uh, and those x y locations uh, are going to be vectors with with this with this respect to this link frame. Um, we want to figure out how we can do two D rotation. So let's consider there's a rotation axis that's that's going out of the plane here, and around that about that rotation axis, we want to do uh, a, a rotation by the by by angle theta. And so, you know, so if we wanted to think about this first algebraically, how can we how can we specify a rotation of, of each of these points? So let's just consider a particular point P, uh, which has an X and Y coordinate. Um, how what algebra algebraic expressions could take us from the X and Y locations of a particular point? Uh, where from where we started and and bring it and and transform the frame such that or transform those points such that we can get a, a new rotated point. And so if you think about it for a second or put the video on pause, uh, you know, we could come up with uh, with algebra that looks like like this. Where essentially we take the 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 um, the you know, we can form the new X coordinate of our point by taking X cosine theta, subtracting uh, Y Y sine theta. And similarly, we could take we can find our new Y coordinate that's rotated by taking uh, X times sine theta plus Y times cosine theta. If we think about this, uh, what we have are two equations and uh, and and two variables that we need to find these these points. And so we can we can take this algebra and actually express it as a as a matrix multiplication. And so if we think about so so we could simply take our existing point x the x y of that multiply it by this matrix that that is parameterized by a value of theta an angle theta multiply once we once we get that that um, that angle, we can uh, we can per, we can we can instantiate this matrix, mul perform the matrix multiplication, and get uh, get our x x prime y prime prime that's going to perform this uh, this rotation, this counterclockwise rotation. And so, just remember in this case that uh, that that we have the right hand rule, and so the right hand rule says that we can uh, that that it, that um, that we can just look at our, our right hand and that gives us, and we're going to just make it uh, such that the, so each of our, our fingers are as, uh, as our, as perpendicular to each other as possible. And, um, and we're going to assume that our rotation happens about this Z axis. That's that represents my thumb. And if I curled my fingers, then that would represent uh, the direction of rotation. So that would represent the counterclockwise movement that we would get in this case. And so Z is in our, for, for the example that we had, Z is pointing upward, X is, is pointing out and Y is pointing along my, the long middle axis. Um, and so we actually have to worry about this because sometimes people don't, uh, you know, they use different connotations, different conventions for how they think about these axes. Um, so if you're using Ross or, or Ross bridge, um, you know, then Z is going to be up, X is going to be forward, and um, 
and Y is going to be lateral. But if you're in the browser and you're using uh, Knievel or 3JS, uh, you should know that it's quite different and that, that Y is going to be up, Z is forward and X is lateral. And if you're an aerospace engineer, Z is going to be pointing down and, and you know, there's going to be different, different coordinates. And so we have to be mindful of these different coordinates, especially because the URDF that we're getting is going to be defined in the coordinates that we have for ROS. Um, but in the browser, when we're using Knievel, it's going to use a different coordinate convention. So we have to, we have to do some transforms as well to consider that, uh, the, the, the different convention. And so just as a, as a quick checkpoint, uh, what's a 2D matrix for rotation by zero degrees? Think about it. Or put the video on pause, or uh, hopefully it, it comes to you immediately. Um, that that should look like our, ident our 2D identity matrix, right? Um, what's, a what's a 2D rotation matrix for, uh, for rotation by 90 degrees? About our z-axis again. Out of plane z-axis. Think about it. All right. Um, so just remembering that, you know, from basic high school geometry, that uh, that the cosine of 90 degrees is going to be zero and um, and the sine of 90 degrees will be one. And so if we plug those into the form of the matrix that we have here, we get we can just we should be able to figure out what that uh, what that matrix looks like just off of off of just simple recall. And if we multiply that through, then we can see that 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 if we multiply 0.23 by this matrix, we get the new rotated point. Negative uh, three two, and so one one thing that we can also do is if we don't have to consider we don't have to do this for every single individual point. If we take all of our four points for our box geometry or any number of points that we have, we can use each each we can form each point as a column of our matrix on the on the right hand on the right side. Um, and multiply those through, right? And so because we're taking a two by two matrix and multiplying it by a two by n number of vertices. And so what we'll get in the end is we'll get a two by n matrix uh, that, that's the resulting that will be all of our transform vertices. And we can do that for any of these transforms moving forward. Just making sure that the, that the matrix dimensions line up properly for multiplication. And so from a more general sense, I'm blocking this right now, but, but you'll have to forgive me. Uh, this, there's a, a 2D frame relation that, that, that holds in this case. And so we should note that, uh, that, when, that we get a new frame that results from, from this rotation. So when we rotate, uh, when, when, we, when we're in frame zero and we're thinking about frame one, the result of the rotation with respect to its reference frame, frame zero, uh, we have, um, we we get uh, we get we get this relationship that that, that instantiates. And note, uh, if we use the the notation from from the Spong textbook, um, what we get is uh, is we can express frame zero as as O zero, which is the origin of that frame, with x zero and y zero, which are the respective x and y axes. And we can do the same thing for frame one. So we'll, you'll you'll see that notation throughout the throughout this this course. And so uh, when we're when we're looking at this, uh, we should note that uh, that the rotation matrix that we have here represents uh, these dot pro these uh, these multiplications that we have here. And so so it takes it takes this form. And there's nice things about this. And so we should note that um, that these are really scalar projections of our of our unit vectors, uh, the the bases of the of the matrix, and so the and and the columns of this matrix describe these axes with respect to to frame one and frame zero. So if we take the columns of our of our rotation matrix, um, those matrices represent the axes of of uh, of x one of of x and y in frame one with respect to frame zero. We should also note that this matrix, and probably one of the more more important things of, about this matrix, is that um, is that its uh, its determinant is one, um, and uh, well, I should say um, it's it's an orthonormal matrix. So that means that all the rows and columns are uh, are have are vectors of of length one, their unit length, and each of the vector, each of the the rows uh, and columns respectively, are going to be orthogonal to each other. And so that means that the determinant we get from this is one. Um, it also leads to this interesting fact that if we want to find the inverse of this rotation matrix, all we have to do is, is take the transpose of it. 
um, the space of all orthonormal matrices in two dimensions and that are two by two matrices uh, are going is forms the special orthogonal group two. Um, and so any member of, uh, of uh, and this a special orthogonal group two is, is noted as SO2, any member of SO2 is going to represent a 2D rotation. Uh, we should also note, as we said before, that the columns of the, of the rotation matrix describe these axes in X, Y. And so, um, so there is a, a story that we have here um, I, I can, uh, that, um, that each row represents the unit direction of, uh, of X, O with respect to frame one. And similarly, the columns represent the unit direction of X, one with respect to frame zero. So that describes rotation. Um, and so we've talked about in 2D and we'll continue to move forward. Um, but let's let's shift gears and talk about translation. So we can rotate, can we can we translate? Um, and you know, the answer is most certainly yes, um, except the algebra now looks a little bit different. Um, so if we have the algebra here, we have uh, we can say that our new point, so when we perform a translation, so if we consider each vertex to be X and Y again, uh, we can add an offset along X, which is dx, and an offset along y, uh, dy, to all of these points, and that's going to give us a shifting, a translation of our of the of the geometry of our of our link frame. Um, it's going to be hard to think about how we can form a two by two matrix that would that would actually do this. So we, we may not get that nice form that we had um, for rotation. Um, but if we if we think about how a, another approach that we could do, we could use uh, homogeneous coordinates. And so instead of having a two by two uh, matrix that performs this, we're going to actually make this a three by three. Um, and so what we're going to do is take our um, take our points and we're going to add we're going to form a two D vector again. But then we're going to make it into three a three element vector with a one at the bottom. And so that's going to that's going to represent this as a as a our 2D point as a 3D vector where every where all of our points reside on the plane where um, where the third element uh, Z is equal to one will always be equal to one. And so now we can express our translation by uh, by keeping an identity, a three by three identity matrix. Um, where the rotation part of this is going to remain the identity. Uh, you can see that in the upper, uh, upper left-hand corner of the matrix D. And then uh, on the, on the right-hand side, on the rightmost column, there'll be a, our DX is going to be there. So if we perform this multiplication between this vector and this matrix, we'll note that the result will be, uh, will, will lead to our offset, our, our translation for the X and Y components, and the one will remain the same. And so that is how we're going to perform this translation. Um, and so all we have, all we really need are the parameters of this D matrix to be able to, uh, to be able to carry out this, uh, this translation. So quickly, what's the 2D matrix for, for translation? I'm not, not going to give you any time to think about that. We're just moving on. And it's just simply, uh, for, for negative one, two, just a, just a simple, just plunking it right into the, into the rightmost column. And so you note, if we have our, uh, our vector negative three, two, where uh, we apply this, this matrix multiply and we get the, we get the resulting vector negative four, four. And that, that works as it should. So, um, so these notions of having, of being able to do translation and rotation to our, ver to our vertices starts to build us up towards, uh, towards basically doing both uh, in our transforms. And this gets, gets us to the, to the notion of a rigid motion, which allows us to do rotation and translation. There are more general notions, such as an affine transform, which allows for more than, than rotation translation. It also allows for, for, for scaling effects, uh, shearing, reflection. Uh, you can see some of those transforms as part of the 3JS uh, library if you want to dig deeper. Um, I, we're only going to stick for, for, our, for our robots right now. We're only going to think about rotation and translation because we're assuming that our structures are going to be rigid. And so, uh, so when we're thinking about this uh, a rigid motion, we need to be able to compose translation and rotation together. And so, um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take our, uh, what we can do is take our rotation and translation that we have for two dimensions, and we could multiply those together and see what, and, and that should, that will give us a, um, and that can give us an idea of what this could look like. So, um, so for instance, let's take, uh, let's take our rotation by 90 degrees. And then, uh, and then after that perform a, uh, a subsequent, uh, translation, 
uh, by uh, by negative negative one two, and what we get is if we multiply that together. If we compose our two our two uh, our two examples from the from the past, you'll see that we actually can just per perform these multiplications in succession, and that gets us our combined um, our combined uh, uh, effect that we saw from the from the previous examples. Um, if we multiply those two matrices together, pre-multiply them instead of carrying them out in uh, in in in, um, in sequence, uh, then we can get one matrix that represents the combined rotation and translation. And so that one matrix then becomes, uh, if we want to think about it, that becomes a transform that we can store to, to remember uh, this, uh, this, this effect. And so this starts to get us to a, to a more general notion of what a homogenous transform could look like, where we have a composition of rotation and translation. Um, so if we go back and think about what we need for forward kinematics to represent these local transforms, what we'll see is that we have a rotation block in the upper left-hand corner, and a translation part, translation vector along the along the right hand, so along the right side of this this matrix, along this homogeneous transform, we can uh, we can break that uh, we can we can specify that um, you know more generally by calling these homogeneous transform as existing in the of, of being consistent of a group, what we call SE two, which is the special Euclidean group two. Um, and so any matrix of, of this form where you have, uh, it would be considered a member of this group. Um, so in this case, we have matrix H, which is the member of SE2, which means that it has an orthonormal, uh, upper, or orthonormal uh, block, two by two block uh, um, in its upper left-hand side. And so this is, so that block, so those, those entries have to form, a, uh, have to be an, or has to be an orthonormal matrix, which means it's an element of SO2. Um, and then on our, our right-hand column for, for dy, uh, for, for the for dx and dy, um, we, those just have to be uh, has to be a real vector. So those just have to be real real numbers. And if we have a if we have a matrix of this form, then it is a homogeneous transform that will apply a rotation and a, a followed by a translation. And so let's put this into a, into an example for our for our, for a robot that I just made up. Uh, it just arbitrary example. Um, so this is a robot we, I'm calling Boxy. And so, uh, so Boxy looks like this. Um, uh, there's a reason I'm in computer science and robotics and not design and, uh, <laughs> or anything like that. So, so just, uh, so that's, that is Boxy. And so let's say that we had Boxy and, uh, and we wanted to, uh, and we, and Boxy has its own, uh, coordinate frame, uh, that, that's, that's for the, for this robot. Um, let's say that we're given a, a link for, for this, so this is an arm that we want to put on the robot, and that that ro that link exists in its own frame as well. And so, what we want to be able to do is take that link and put and put it into its proper position onto the onto the robot frame. And so, what we need is a transform uh, this T this transform from the link frame into the into the robot's frame T robot link um, that will perform this uh, this translation uh, or tra transformation. Of the of points into the for the link into the into the robots frame, and we can do that simply by the matrix multiplication we talked about before. Um, and so we're going to assume that we have uh, once in order to perform this, we're going to we have this matrix uh, that's that that's uh, that for now is just going to we're assume that it can be computed, and uh, and and that um, and that matrix will allow us to transform all of these points, and so. It, I find it, it's helpful to think about this frame relation in a number of steps. Um, first, let's assume that the that the the robot, both the robot and the link, believe that they are the center of the world. So we'll start by by um, by having the fr by by taking the frame, the you know the rob the link frame. Uh, if it's it, because it believes it's it's the center of the world, um, it's going to assume that its own frame is going to be aligned with the robot base frame or the or the true the true reference frame. What we're going to do is then rotate that frame by uh, by the rotation in our in our um, in our transform and then translate out to its proper positioning, and that will give us the relationship that will put the link out into the it will express the link frame with respect to the robot frame such that we can now transform all of our points through and that will that will put our our our, our um our robot's arm boxy's arm in the right place um one question you might want to ask is why not translate first and then rotate um and 
you could try that. There's nothing wrong with it, but it, that the the effects may be different than you're than you're expecting. So if you saw from the past when we had uh, when we're thinking about our rotation, right? Um, we would like to we'd like to make sure that our rotate that if we're just rotating that our that our our that our our um, our, our geometry stays in the same place. Um, but if we translate first and we have a fixed translation in this case, um, you should note that that means that our, our axis of rotation is somewhere else. And so now we're rotating, not about where we think we are in terms of, the, in terms of just the, the links frame, but we're, we're translating about some other axis that is, that's out there somewhere. And so if you assume that this, uh, this object started at the origin, we translated first and then rotated, we're, we're, we're still, we're out there, we're out somewhere where, where we, or, uh, our rotation axis is not where we think it is. And so, so, um, so I, I love this. Uh, I, I don't know if it's still up. I didn't try it before I put my, my, uh, before I put these slides up, but, uh, but I, I, but I found this, uh, this, uh, this demo really cool. Um, so now what we can be able to do is, is we can express translation and rotation as a single matrix for our, um, for one transform, for, 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 for one transform, uh, can we compose multiple tra frame transforms together? Um, and we can do that too. And so consider now, so we've gone from boxy, let's consider just a, a more generic, uh, three, uh, uh, planar two linked arm, uh, with that will have three frames on it. So if we start off, we have our, our base link right here, then we have frame one and then attach to that frame two. And so this is just a, a simple arm. Uh, and so each of these is going to have their own transformation. So, uh, so frame, the transform from, from uh, of frame one with respect to frame zero is going to have a rotation matrix and a vector offset. Um, and similar, the, the relationship between frame two and uh, with respect to frame one will have that as well. Algebraically, we can express this by saying that a point P, if we want to relate a point in frame one, uh, uh, P1 with respect to uh, with respect to its reference frame P0, uh, this algebra basically says that we're going to rotate first. Uh, so we're going to multiply that that P by the rotation matrix and then add the translation onto that. That same algebra applies to our our point in frame two. Then with respect to frame one, so we can take point point P2, multiply it by the by the rotation, add the translation on, um, and then we can have then that will give us our, our point P1. If we simply substitute P1 and the second equation into for the P1 in our in our first equation, we'll end up with the with the expression below, which uh, which gives us P which gives us uh, which will be able to to say how we can relate a point P2 that is in frame two with respect to reference frame uh, reference frame zero, and so this allows us to to compose these two frames together. And so we get this entire expression and that allows us to actually ex actually compose these, uh, these um, or actually consider the, these, these frames all together. Um, one thing that we should note is that if we look, if we consider the, if we multiply these two matrices, rotation matrices together, we can get a combined rotation matrix that is the rotation from, the rotation uh, that, is a frame, that is frame two with respect to frame zero. And similarly, we can express the offset, the the transform. I mean, the the um, the translational offset uh, of frame two with respect to frame one, as in this entire expression here. If we plug, if we take these two elements and then consider those to be uh, to be their own individual rotations and translations, now we get a we get a combined expression that allows us to directly relate point P two as a as a rotation of point P2 plus a translation to get to express this with the frame with, with, the, with respect to frame zero. And I didn't have enough room on the slide, so the block multiplication is on the top. So if you're reading downwards, you just have to you have to go back up to the top. And so now we can compose, and this will work, this will work for any number of rotations, uh, any number of transforms. So we can compose these all together and do this, uh, and we'll end up doing this recursively. Um, so we can also extend this to three dimensions. This, uh, this provides for natural extensions into three in, into three dimensions. Um, so before, uh, so so all we're really doing is now adding a, another column to our matrix. So um, so now instead of having instead of having a a a, 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 a three by three matrix that represents a homogeneous transform in two D, now we're going to have a four by four matrix that represents homogeneous transformations in 
in uh, in three dimensions. Um, and so our translation just adds another column and, a, and another another row. We keep the we can keep the identity in the in the upper upper uh, left hand block, and then you just have another trans another uh, uh, component to the translation. We should note that our rotation about the z axis, which was which is always what we've been doing, we have this implied z axis. We're just going to add another row and column of zeros and ones to that uh, to the to the um, to the uh, to the outside of it on the on the bottom and onto the right. Um, similarly, we can now express rotation about uh, about the x axis and the y axis, and so you get these uh, these forms that are here. Um, you feel free to go through and uh, and then analyze those and see make sure they make sense, but but we'll just take those as uh, as given um, for rotations about x and y as well. If we wanted to compose all of these together, we can get a we can get a single homogeneous transform that says that we can multiply. Uh, we can take our uh, we can consider a rotation about about z, about y, about x, and then do a translation, and that's one way of expressing. Uh, a, uh, a, a homogeneous transform that is sort of a, if we want to think of this as sort of a roll, pitch, and yaw, um, or uh, I guess this would be a yaw, pitch, and roll, right? depending on how you look at the world, uh, that, that this, is, this, is how we can, uh, that's, this is how we can express the, the composition of these transforms. If we multiply all of those together, we'll end up with this 3D homogeneous transform such that what we now have is something that exists in the special Euclidean group 3, uh, which is the same thing as SE2, but uh, especially Clinton Group 2, um, but now in three dimensions, where we should note that our um, that our rotation is now a three by three rotation that ex that is uh, orthonormal, so that we so it is an element of SO2 SO3, um, and that our translation is now a real vector three, and so so that's going to be the form of the matrix that we're that we're looking at. Um, and so uh, what we should note is that this, uh, this, this matrix that's now in SE3, um, we can compose these, these matrices together. So if we just do, uh, if, so let's just do this sort of block, block representation. So we'll assume we had, uh, had a, a three-dimensional frame, uh, a three-dimensional transform from frame one into frame zero, uh, um, or frame, frame one with respect to frame zero. And then we had a, a three-dimensional transform as, uh, that is frame two with respect to frame one. If we just block multiply these together, um, then we end up with the expression that we have here on the, uh, at, at the end, which is essentially showing us a comp the composition of our, of our matrices. Um, that 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 holds in this case and that um, and so we can always then take points in frame two or how many other frames that we would like to be able to to compose together and uh, and be able to put them into our base rep base um, uh, base reference frame frame zero and so uh, so we're going to have uh, so for each of our each of our joints is, is going to represent a uh, is going to represent a transform or uh, each of these edges in our hierarchy is going to represent a transform of a child with respect to a parent, and so we're going to have. So what we're going to have with with any of these uh, any of these robots that were that were given any description, we're going to have to traverse this structure. And every time we we hop from uh, we we get we encounter a joint, we're going to have to consider a new transform that we that we consider in this recursive in this hierarchical structure, uh, and we're going to define a recursion that allows us to to compute this, and so. Um, and so this, this, so the question that we now want to ask is how do we compose these matrices hierarchically to, to generate not just the transform with respect to uh, a parent, the a links, uh, a link or child or joints parent, but with respect to the global, uh, global world workspace world frame. And so coming back to our checklist, we've covered about how to represent homogeneous transforms. Now we want to turn our attention to how to compute the transform uh, to the end effector frame in the, in the workspace. And so uh, before we jump into that, uh, I'm just going to go into a, into a quick tangent. Uh, big points for anybody who can tell me where in the world this sign is, that where I took this picture for this sign. I'd be curious if anybody actually knew. Um, but one thing that, that, that just a, a quick tangent is that uh, we have to that it's just helpful to complete the, the kinematic graph. And Knievel, the way that we've struck the code, you have to complete the kinematic graph for, for links. Um, what you should note is that what we get in URDF is only the um, only the, the the joints specify the relationships between their their relationship between the links, um, but the links don't specify any relationship to their to other links or to the joints, and so so we need to be so it's just helpful to complete this information 
um, before we start in on, on, on doing our kinematic com com computation. So we should note that, that just given to, given in the URDF file, uh, we have, you know, the joint specifies its child and its parent. Um, what we need you to do is go through and, and just write a, a, a few lines to just to also say for the links, uh, the links can also specify um, its children and its, and its parents. Um, and that means that, uh, and we should note that a, a link could have zero to many, to multiple children, uh, but we'll only have one parent. And so doing a little bit of bookkeeping at a time will save us some, some, some time later on. Um, one thing that we can also do is if you, if you have this setup structured, uh, then, then I, then you should be able to tra traverse the, the kinematic hierarchy of the, of the robot. And I use VI keys cause I'm just a VI kind of person, um, to, to, to move between the, the links actively. And so let me just show, uh, I'll just show a quick demo of that in action. So here I am back in the browser with the MR2 robot. I'm going to turn off the display of all joints. And so right now we're at one of the, the joints, which is uh, at the, is the joint off the base, base link. And so if I, if I press, uh, press H to go to its sibling, this will go to, uh, to the sibling joint and back. And if I press J, that will move down the kinematic hierarchy to the next joint, the next joint after that, and the next joint after that. And I can go back up the kinematic hierarchy to the, to the parent. Um, you should note that if I did this the right way, that I should, uh, that if I try to go beyond, so if I try to recurse down and go, uh, go beyond uh, a leaf node in the kinematic structure, that it will stop me from doing that. Or if I try to go up beyond the root, the, beyond the root link, it will stop me from doing that too. And so this is just helpful for, uh, for, um, for how we're thinking about doing for, for how, for just to, to interact with, uh, with the, with the robot when it's, uh, when it's live. Um, similarly, if we move over to the to the fetch, so I'm going to move over to the fetch robot real quick. Uh, it's going to look a little bit different, but it's going to be it's going to be uh, going to be similar. So let me just move right here. Um, you should note I'm going to just go on a little bit. Uh, so that disc right there, that that yellow disc represents the currently active uh, active joint um, or uh, active. Yeah, active active joint, and so I'm gonna I can move up the hierarchy. You can note that it's oriented the right way. So if you implement vector cross, we will orient that uh, that joint uh, cylinder the right way. And I can uh, move. Uh, that's what I wanted. We now need to think about how we can compute the transform for each of our joints and our links, and we're gonna do this through a recursive matrix stack uh, that's gonna allow that's gonna be amenable to to forward kinematics computation. Um, and so our goal with this is to compute the transform of each frame for each node in our kinematic tree, uh, all the frames associated with that. We want to compute its, uh, its, its position in the, in the world frame, uh, which is going to be up there. We're going to assume our approach is going to, uh, is going to compose transforms along this kinematic tree using a stacked data structure. Um, and this recursion is going to maintain, we're going to, we're going to push and pop, uh, transforms, a uh, matrix transforms, a four by four transforms onto and off of this stack. And we're going to note that the top, the current top of the stack is going to represent, uh, is going to rep represent the transform at our current node with respect to the world frame. And our recursion is going to, is going to, to work this way where we're going to alternate where we start off with the, with the, with the global, with the base link which is in the, in a global coordinate frame. And then we're going to, to alternate our recursion between joints and links. So we should note that we're always going, if we're, whenever we're at a, at a, at a, at a link, our children will be joints. Whenever we're in a joint, our, uh, our child will be a, will be a, um, a link. And so we're going to, we can have separate routines or some way to process each of those separately. And so we're going to alternate between processing joints and links. For every link, we're just we're, our jo main job is to recurse over the children because the link induces no motion, no no direct transforms, at least the way that we're doing it in this class. And for every joint, we need to consider the rotational and translational effects of that joint and its positioning away off on the link, as well as the motor rotation, which we'll talk a little bit, or motor uh, the motion of the motor with uh, and its joint state uh, at for at, uh, um, with respect uh, to the to the parent. And so what we're going to do is start at the, at the world frame, which is going to be the root of our kinematic tree. 
And we're going to note that in workspace, so we're down here at the bottom, we're going to consider this uh, sort of a view of workspace. That the global origin is considered the, the center of the, the center of the world for our, for our workspace. Um, our matrix stack is going to start off as the identity. So we're going to have a stack and we're just going to push the identity matrix because uh, the identity says that you are, there's, um, you are the, your frame is the identity with respect to itself. Um, and so we're going to then, uh, we're then going to, when we want to consider the global coordinates um, of the robot, the positioning of the base, um, we're going to, we're going to push our, the current top of the stack uh, when we're going to visit this child. So as we go to the, to the global, um, the global coordinates, we're going to push a copy of, of the, of the matrix upwards. And then we're going to consider the, the we're going to compute the transform of the, the child node with respect to its parent. And so in the global coordinates, we should note that our robot at the base of the robot is going to have some position and orientation with respect to the world. You consider this to be like, you can consider this to be like the position and orientation of a drone or an airplane or the mobile base of a robot or, or, uh, or a big dog or something like that. Um, and so we can compute matrices, uh, or we can, we can compute, uh, uh, homogeneous matrices that represent the translation and the rotation due to these uh, to the global uh, global position global uh, pose of the robot with respect to the world, and we're going to call that uh, DW1 is going to be the is going to be the the translation with respect to the world, and RW1 is going to be the rotation with respect to the world. And so we'll note that we get uh, that, that now a frame relation is induced that gives us a that gives us. Um, that's going to apply this rotation and translation of the of uh, of the global frame of the the base frame with respect to uh, with respect to the world frame. We'll take that matrix. We'll multiply it uh, onto the onto the right side of uh, of the top of the matrix stack, and that's going to give us our new uh, the new top of our of our of our matrix stack. And we should note at that matrix stack that that's uh, that represents the current transform of our of the frame that we're considering. We can store that matrix into uh, in Knievel. We'll store that that matrix into robot.origin.x form, and that gives us uh, so that will maintain this uh, the proper uh, pose of the base. Uh, just a, a quick note that uh, that right now when we're computing these uh, we're computing the the rotations. Uh, these this is going to be using at least for, for now it's going to be using Euler angles. Um, and so that means that you have to choose a particular order at which to apply these rotations. And so you could do, um, you could do Z first, then Y, then X, you could do X, then Y, then Z, you could do Z, Y, Z, you could do Y, Z, Y, X, Z, Y. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's many different choices and we should note that as we're going to talk about next lecture, that matrix, that, um, that these rotations are not commutative. Um, they will, you have to consider the order. The order will induce a different result. And so right now we're going to just remember that in this class, we use X, Y, Z order, um, that we're going to do X, then Y, then Z. So now that we've, we've considered our global positioning of the, the positioning of the global frame, uh, we're going to now traverse to our base link, our, our child link. Um, and so this is going to be, and this this link is going to be specified by robot.base in the in the URDF file or the URDF uh, JavaScript object. Um, and we should note that this that even though we're calling this link one, um, actually it's representing representing link zero with respect to the notation in the spawn book. And so this the you know things get a little bit dicey because we're considering mobile manipulators and we're considering these global coordinates, but uh, but we're going to really treat quote unquote link one as link zero with respect to, uh, with respect to um, the description in the textbook. So once we have this link, what we're going to do, or the, one of the main purposes of the link is to rep, is to transform the geometry of a, uh, the geometry that's re resident at a link into the world frame. So let's assume that we have just uh, for our simple example, our URDF uh, example, we've got link one here. And so these are the vertices of, of the, of the link one geometry represented in link in, in the link one frame. Um, and so that's, uh, and so that's, uh, so, so that's, that's just sort of, uh, what we've had in the past, but what we're going to do is we can take that the top of the matrix stack here represents the current frame, the current transform of the, of the link frame into the, 
into the world. So if we take this, uh, the refer the, and we're going to consider the M stack to be a reference to the top of the stack, um, which if you're going to do this recursively should be a local variable. Remember to put var in front of this to make it a local variable. Um, but once we have the, once we have this M stack, uh, reference to this transform, we can take that, multiply it by our, um, by our, uh, our, our, um, our vertices. And we should note that the M stack, we can store that in the, in the transform here uh, to just note that that's, uh, that we're storing the link, uh, that this transform will get stored in, in this, uh, in this X form variable. So, so the, the code stencil knows it's there, but once the code stencil knows that, that that is the, the proper transform, it will perform this multiplica multiplication for you. Um, and that will, that will transform all the links in the link one frame into the into the world frame. And that just happens, Knievel does that for you by default. Um, but you gotta provide this 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 transform. And so this is how we put link one into its into the into the world. So now that we have uh, now that we've we've established that the link one and we've put the we can transform the vertices in the world, we can go down to the first child. So link one has two children, joint one and joint two. Uh, we're gonna recurse this in a depth first fashion depth for search fashion. And so we're gonna to go to, to joint one. That's gonna move the top of the stack up and do it in applying a copy. Just remember that if you're doing this uh, recursion via function calls, that, um, that, uh, that, that, the, that this copy can happen for you uh, by default through the, through the JavaScript uh, runtime environment. Um, but once you have that at the top of the stack, we can then specify uh, we know that the that this joint is going to have a particular positioning and a particular pose with respect to its parent link, um, and so that pose is going to have a origin X Y Z, which is going to be the translation of the joint from its parent link, and an origin R P Y uh, property, which is going to be the roll pitch yaw uh, rotation of the joint uh, with respect to its parent link. And so once we have those, and we can compute. Uh, the, we can compute the the we can compute matrices uh, homogeneous transform for for these that will consider consist of a, a of a um, of a rotation and a translation. Uh, we can take those two to uh, we can take that combined transform and then uh, and then up uh, and then mu multiply it to the right side of the top of the stack and that now becomes the becomes that that top of the stack and so we'll we'll take this local transform. And by multiplying to the top, it becomes the, the transform back into the world at the top of the stack. Um, and we just note that we're going to store that uh, that top of the stack into the transform uh, for joint one, dot, this dot X form. So once we have that joint in place, we can then recurse to uh, to the child link of this joint. And so, uh, so now what we're going to be now what we're going to get is uh, is link two, and it's going to have a particular geometry. Uh, we should note that these gonna, are going to be vertices of link two in link two frame. And so, once we have these vertices in link two frame, uh, we can um, we can multiply them by the top of the matrix stack, which is going to consider uh, which is going to consider the um, the transformation uh, from link from uh, link two frame or for joint one frame to, uh, to the link one frame and then out to the, uh, out to the world coordinates. And so that will put, that will put link two in its proper, uh, proper positioning in the global, in the global frame, in the world frame. Once we do that, then we're at the, at the, we're at a leaf node and we're at the end of the, of the matrix stack. So what we should then do if we're, if we have a recursive formulation, a recursive algorithm, that we would then pop back up to the stop, up back up to link ones. Essentially, what would happen for function calls is your functions would just return, and then you would come back, and the call stack would then be at link one when you pop back up. And so now we can we we can we we process joint one. We can then recurse to the second child joint, um, and so this will now bring us to joint two. Um, as we do that, we will then pop back up to the, we'll push the top of the matrix stack back up to the, um, uh, to, on, uh, we'll put the top, uh, a copy to the top of the matrix stack. Um, and then, uh, and then we will compute a local transform, uh, for, uh, for joint two with respect to, uh, or frame, frame three with, re uh, with respect to, 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 um, frame one. Um, and then we'll, that will give us the positioning of joint two. We'll compute that local transform. We'll multiply uh, um, that transform to the right side of the top of the matrix stack. 
Um, and then, uh, and then that will allow us to properly uh, move down and 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 uh, and render and transform the um, the uh, the the vertices of link three. And so then, when we recurse to the child link, we'll be able to take the vertices of of link three, multiply them by the top of the matrix stack, and that will give us the proper positioning of link three with respect to the world frame. Once we do that, then we have uh, then we can recurse through the through the child joint. Uh, so then we're gonna we're gonna have uh, joint three. So joint three will now be uh, will will now be um, will now be traversed as part of this re recursion, and uh, that will pop up another transform to the top of the stack where we take the local transform that's computed, multiply it to the to the right side of the top of the matrix stack. That gives us uh, that gives us the new coordinate frame where we can we can transform uh, our last element, our last node, link four, and multiply it by uh, multiply the, the 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 vertices of link four by the top of the matrix stack to get our uh, our link four with respect to the with respect to the world frame. Once we've done that, we've processed our last node, and so then we're going to pop back up. So we're going to pop, 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 and we're done. And so at that point, we have laid out, we've been able to, to compute the Ford kinematics so that we have all of the transforms for all of our joints and links specified and all of our frames in place. Um, and so this gets us to the, to the point where now we know how to compute the transform, the end effector, our Ford kinematics list. If we can do all those things, we've got all it checked off and we can, we can, we can start rendering our robot out, which will be great. So the next question we should be asking is, we talked about the we talked about how we compute this for the end effector, but can we actually compute where the where the location of the end effector is going to be? Uh, because you know, because because uh, what if we want our robot to to help us uh, make sushi or or deliver a sushi or just operate with sushi? Uh, robots and sushi just seems to be like uh, just be, seems to be a fun thing to to try to do. Um, so. Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, is we're going to take, uh, we're just going to try to figure out what location are you actually grasping? You know, where, where is the salmon roll here in this case? And so, um, and so if we're thinking about what, uh, where, where link two could, uh, where, where this point could be, what we have to be able to do is transform points, uh, that are on a link into, into the world frame. So let's assume that I have point, uh, a point on link two, and I want to transform that point out to the out to the world frame, assuming that I've computed all of my forward kinematics, all my all my transforms are in place. Uh, how would I do this? How what what should I multiply this by? Um, take a second to think about it. It's the afternoon, so I don't have my coffee with me, so uh, so I'll just have to just stare at you for a little bit. All right, time's up. Uh, and so the, so all we're going to do is multiply this, uh, by the transform that we've computed. So we've already computed the, the transform of link two with respect to the world. We do, all we have to do is take some new point, multiply it. And that gives us that same point in the link frame expressed with respect to the world. Um, the one point, and so we should note that this um, homogeneous transform that is, uh, composing a rotation followed by a translation. And that's just the general form. What the point that we really care about is uh, is the end effector. So in this case, we've got avocado roll instead of salmon roll. Um, and so let's say that I know the I know the vector in the link frame to the to where the end effector uh, gripper point is. Um, how do I convert that? Uh, how do I express now that that where the end effector is going to be with respect to the world frame? Um, it should be no surprise that I'm going to take. This this vector for the end effector multiply it by the um, by the last link. So this is this is saying link n. So it's going to be link four in this this case. So I multiply it by the transform from link four frame with respect to the world. Um, I multiply my end effector vector by that, and that gives me the location of the end effector. Now I can predict where the where the end effector will be with respect to uh, with respect to the world frame. Here's something a little bit different. What if I have a point in the world and I want to know where that is with respect to the link? Um, so now I'm given a point in the robot in the in the robots you know in the robot frame or the world frame. Um, where is that point with respect to the link? How would I figure that out? Um, anybody you think of that one? You may want to think about a little for a little bit. Um, what what multiplication can I do at, at this point? Yeah. 
<laughs> uh, and so what I would do in this case is I would I could multiply by the inverse of the transform uh, of the transform of link one link two with respect to the world, right? And so now I can take that same transform that I have. If I can invert it, then I can be able to take points in the world frame and express them with respect to the link. I can go back if I wanted to. Um, and you know, and that that inverse, uh, you know, if you've if you followed along with what we what we've been saying uh, throughout this throughout this video this lecture, um, is actually not that bad. Um, so we should just remember that um, that uh, that um, so just asserting the relationship that um, that uh, that the transform from uh, from the world into link two frame, uh, well, the world with respect to link two is going to be the inverse of what we've already computed for forward kinematics, which is going to be link two with respect to the world. Um, just for, and we should note that if I, that I, we can decompose this transform into a, into a succession of rotations of isolated rotations and, and translations. And so if we can want to consider the inverse of all of those things together, what we can do is take that inverse and then, uh, and then bring it inside of the parenthesis. So we just have to remember from linear algebra that if I want to take the inverse of a product of, uh, of a product of matrices, right? So if I have matrix A times matrix B and then the inverse of that, I can compute the inverse, that inverse by, uh, by reversing their, their order and then taking the inverses of the individual, of the individual matrices themselves. This is very helpful because now we can do the same thing with our, um, with our, um, with our, uh, with, with our individual rotations and translations. And we should remember that these, that these inverses are actually pretty, pretty tractable. So for, you know, for the inverse of a rotation matrix, if we remember uh, that it's an element of, that it's a member of a uh, special orthogonal group uh, three, that the inverse is simply going to be the transpose for these, for these matrices. Now, if I take, uh, if I take the, if I take my rotation matrix, I compute, I transpose it. So that means flipping it about the, about the diagonal where the ones, where the, where uh, the diagonal of the matrix, um, then that allows me to, uh, to compute the, these inverses. Um, similar, just as easy as well, the inverse of a translation matrix. Um, that's pretty easy too. Um, so that's going to be the, um, that's simply the negation of the right hand column. So we're just taking our, uh, we're taking our, um, our, our translational part of our homogeneous transform, negating it, and that is an inverse. You can double check to make sure that these are right by simply computing, c coming up with some examples or, or writing the matrices in general form, and then, uh, and then, then computing these inverses, multiplying the matrices together and make sure that you get the inverse back. And so that will be, uh, that, that's, uh, that's what we do. And so, so knowing that we can compute, that we can get all of these matrices, multiply them together, that gives us, a, a, that gives us an inverse. Um, so we can think about this as just a quick example. Uh, if we go back to our, our earlier example, we had um, 0.23 in homogeneous coordinates, and we were multiplying it by this matrix that we composed together to get uh, point negative four four. If we go back and we split it up into its its co its component uh, rotation and translation, um, what we can do is if we wanted to go back from point from negative four four to two three, we can compute the we can compute the inverse. So we're going to take these uh, these composed matrices of the modulus transform. We're going to um, we're going to uh, to then uh, to then uh, to then reverse their order, compute the inverse. So now we we've reversed their order up there. Um, we've negated the uh, we've negated the translation, and we've transposed the uh, we've transposed the the rotation, uh, and we multiply them back. and And we also want to make sure. And so we multiply them together. We get this inverse. We're just double checking to make sure that if we multiply our if we multiply our our matrix by our inverse that we get the identity back and so we can so we double check that and then now if we if we take our point that we that we originally transformed multiply it by our inverse we get our original point uh, two three and so that's just a good thing to to have and and to note um, and so now we can draw a robot in 3D. What's next? What have we what have we not done? Well, you remember we need to come back and revisit. Uh, we need to come back and revisit the um, uh, how we can consider motor rotations, and so uh, so we're gonna we're gonna think about how we can represent the motion due to joints, and then um, and then also uh, the translation about about some arbitrary axis. Um, 
And in order to do that, there's, we have to, so translation might be easy to express in terms of, in terms of motion by the axis, but uh, rotation is going to take a little bit more insight. And so we're going to talk about next, that next time. And, and it will lead us to the, the notion of quaternions. Um, so with that, I just wanted to, uh, to, to thank you again and, uh, and looking forward to our next lecture.